1 Kings 5, from verse 1. Oh, sorry, from verse 6. Oh, from verse 1. Oh, sorry, Chris. <laughs> when Hiram... King of Tyre heard that Solomon had been anointed king to succeed his father David. He sent his envoys to Solomon because he had always been on friendly terms with David. Solomon sent back this message to Hiram. You know that because of the wars waged against my father David from all sides, he could not build a temple for the name of the Lord his God until the Lord put his enemies under his feet. But now, the Lord my God has given me rest on every side, and there is no adversary or disaster. I intend, therefore, to build a temple for the Lord, a temple for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord de told my father David when he said, Your son, whom I will put on the throne in your place, will build the temple for my name. So, Give orders that cedars of Lebanon be cut for me. My men will work with yours, and I will pay you for your men whatever wages you set. You know that we have no one who's so skilled in felling timber as the Sidonians. When Hiram heard Solomon's message, he was greatly pleased and said, Praise be to the Lord today, for he has given David a wise son to rule over this great nation. So Hiram sent word to Solomon, I have received the message you sent me and will do all you want in providing the cedar and juniper logs. My men will haul them down from Lebanon to the Mediterranean Sea and I will float them as rafts by sea to the place you specify. There I will separate them and you can take them away and you are to grant my wish by providing food for my royal household. In this way, Hiram kept Solomon supplied with all the cedar and juniper logs he wanted, and Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as food for his household, in addition to 20,000 20, baths of pressed olive oil. Solomon continued to do this for Hiram year after year. The Lord gave Solomon wisdom, just as he had promised him. There were peaceful relations between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty. King Solomon conscripted laborers from all Israel, 30,000 men. He sent them off to Lebanon in shifts of 10,000 a month, so that they spent one month in Lebanon and two months at home. Adoniram was in charge of the forced labor. Solomon had 70,000 carriers and 80,000 stonecutters in the hills, as well as 30,000 hundred foremen who supervised the project and directed the workers. At the king's command, they removed from the quarry large blocks of high-grade stone to provide a foundation of dressed stone for the temple. The craftsmen of Solomon and Hiram and workers of Byblos cut and prepared the timber and stone for the building of the temple. In the 480th year, after the Israelites came out of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the months of Ziv, the second month, he began to build the temple of the Lord. It's great to be here in West End. Uh, lovely to see you all. Thank you for persevering, for enduring, and, uh, uh, and to you guys at Central, thank you for being willing to gather while we're here, and to those of you at home, I just want to say it's great to have you with us. And uh, I want us to look today at this scripture because uh, we're about to embark on a huge project together. Many of you know we've been waiting for the keys to get in to, to buy, to renovate, and to start to minister from a building that we're calling the Boathouse. And we're nearly there. So uh, these are exciting days. And this is perhaps, I would say, the biggest project that we've been involved in in the 15-year history of Life Church, So it's a significant time for us, which is what drew me to this scripture of Solomon and the temple. It's a big project, 
And can I just say, I want to pick out four principles from this, and, and they're really principles that will help you in any project, whether that's the project of uh, life and marriage and family, whether that's the project of holding down your job and doing well at work, whether that's the project of managing your time, or, or whether that's, a, a, like this, a building project that you're involved in. So you could take these principles and you could actually apply them to anything that you're involved in, because they're helpful principles. So the four things I want to mention are about God's timing, about the targets ahead of us, about tenacity, and about teamwork. So I'm going to spend a few minutes on each of those things. More on the first ones, and they'll get less as we go on. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is timing. We know that God is interested in timing. Did you hear the last verses, or the last verse that Lois read there? In the 480th year after the Israelites had come out of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, the second month, he began to build the temple of the Lord. There are so many references in that one verse to the timing. We've got the year, we've got who's the king, how long they've been king. We've got the month, we've got the name of the month, we've got the fact that it's the second month. So God is really interested in the timing of things. And this timing for Solomon was really important, this time that he was now going to build the temple. You see, even though David had been on the throne uh, in Jerusalem for some 33 years, his father, David had been in a constant state of war uh, with all those around him. So he hadn't been able to build the temple because the Lord had not put his enemies under his feet, is what it says in the scripture. So for some reason, David wasn't able to build. Battles can delay things. That's a reality. Battles can delay things. So whatever project you might be involved in, battles can delay things. And David, even though there were battles going on, David knew that a temple was needed. He knew, just from a practical sense, in the sense of them as a community honouring God, they knew that a temple was needed. We see that in 2 Samuel. He said to Nathan the prophet this, this is what he said, Here I am, living in a palace of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. So he could see the disparity of that. He wasn't happy with the fact that the ark was in a, in a, in a tent and yet he was living in a, a solid building. There was something amiss. And, and we can see the common sense that actually, if we want to honour God, we need a more suitable building from which to do it. It kind of makes sense. I mean, at the moment, we've sold the life centre and all of our staff are working in their front rooms. So even practically, we can see that that's not right. We've got nowhere to feed the poor from. We've got nowhere to minister to people from. We've got no public place to gather people to. So just like Dave, we can see and we know that this, this project is needed. And actually, others encouraged David to build. 2 Samuel 3, again, Nathan replied to David and he said whatever you have in your mind go ahead and do it for the Lord is with you so there were people around David that were saying yeah I know you can see it I know it's in your heart it's clearly needed go on David you do it and so there, there was a kind of prophetic encouragement for him and we've been encouraged by others saying come on you guys in Southampton God's got something ahead for you you know you're building well you've got your sights up and running you need another building now don't you to continue to grow and, and we've had others in churches in Southampton who've been praying for us and encouraging us we've had others in other commission churches who have been praying for us and encouraging us but for some reason David hadn't yet managed to do it I mean, he even wanted to do it. It was a desire of his to build it. You can see that in 1 Chronicles 22, 7. David said to Solomon, My son, I had it in my heart to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. So there was something even in David's personal desire. He really wanted to see it happen. And for years, I've been wanting to be able to say to the church, Come on, guys, we've got this building. We're going we're gonna to start to really minister to the poor and we're really going to start to have other meetings and reaching new people in new places from this building. Do you know, every day, one of the first things that I would do in the day would be to open the Estates Gazette website and have a look at their commercial property section to see if there were any new properties in Southampton that came up for sale. Every day. Every, and if anything came up, I'd book in and try and look at it until we found something. And I, I, like David, I wanted it to happen. So that was in my heart. But, but David, it just didn't seem 
to happen. David even swore an oath that he would do it. He swore an oath to God, Psalm 132. He swore an oath to the Lord and made a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not enter my house or go to my bed. I will allow no sleep uh, to my eyes nor slumber to my eyelids till I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. So he even vowed before God, God, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to build this thing for you. And yet for David, it didn't happen. He didn't build it. Which is where we come to verse 4 of chapter 5. Verse 4 has the words, but now. Whenever you come across two words like that in scripture, you know something significant has changed. But now. All of this has happened, but now. And you know that the light is going to come after the night. And so we've got this but now where something has changed. Well, what's changed now from David's day to Solomon's? Well, a couple of things had changed. The people had changed and the climate had changed. David had gone. He died. This was now Solomon's day. And instead of a day when it was war on every side, this scripture tells us now that there was peace on every side or rest on every side. So in terms of the climate and the environment, this was altogether a different day. And so I want us to consider God's timing for us in this. If God is calling us to establish something, to build something, to renovate something where he's going to be honoured, just like Solomon, it, 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 or just like David really, it's not enough for us just to want a building. It's not enough for us to, to know we need a building. It's not even enough to have others encourage us to get a building and to renovate it. It's, it's, it's not even enough, enough for us to swear an oath before God like David did that we're going to build a building. We actually need to do it. We've actually got to get on and do it. And this is our time to build. You know, Ecclesiastes 3 tells us that there's a time for everything, doesn't it? There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. There is a time to build. So there's a time for everything, and as certain as there is a time for us to be born and a time for us to die, there is a God-ordained time for you and I to build something beautiful for him. And this is really what the title of the message is, Building Something Beautiful for God. And we'll see that as we begin to carry on unpacking this scripture. But the timing is God-ordained. As I said, I've been looking every day, every day, for a building. Nothing. Tried this building. No, we're now not selling it. Tried that building. No, you can't get in to look at it. And then one day, at the beginning of lockdown, I saw the boathouse on the website. And I thought, oh, that's not, that's not going to be any good. Um, about that time, I, I sat down with our elders. And um, I'd said to them, I, I kind of feel like we've gone into lockdown. Bear in mind, we, we'd been in lockdown about two or three weeks. And we probably thought it would last another two or three weeks. But I, I sat down with the elders and I said, I kind of feel like we need to be different when we come back after this. Um, in fact, I kind of feel like we need to sell the life centre almost as, as a faith step. Look, we're going to come back different. And there weren't any buildings on the horizon when we were talking about that. And so we had to talk about it. Over two or three weeks, we'd chat, we'd meet, we'd pray. And we became convinced as a team together that God was saying, yeah, do it. Go on, put that out there. Let that be your faith step. And so we did. We, we put it on the market not knowing where we were going to be, what we were going to be doing. And then a couple of weeks later was when I saw the boathouse in the paper. I thought, oh, now I know. But at the time, I didn't think it was going to be an, a building that would do us at all. And I, I kind of, Joe was going shopping in town, and I said, oh, I've seen this building. It's not going to be any good, but I feel like I need to tick it off my to-do list. So why don't you come with me to have a quick look around this building, and then I'll come with you to the shop afterwards. Oh, okay, she said. So, so we went into the, the building, and we were looking around. We went through the door, and we thought, oh, well, this is a lot bigger than we thought it was. Oh, actually, there's, there's a lot of space here. Actually, this could work really well for a community. This bit would be really good for the church. Actually, I can see the team working here. This could, 
this could actually do us. And so in terms of God's timing, I want you to understand that as we prayed and as we stepped out in faith, God's timing became evident. And, and it's interesting, you know, you talk about timing. I thought we'd then offer on the building and we'd be in. <laughs> yeah, anybody that's ever moved house knows it doesn't work like that. I mean, it was over a year ago this happened now. But listen, God's timing. What would have happened if we'd have exchanged and completed that week? We'd have had 18 months of having to maintain an empty building that we couldn't use. That would have cost us thousands and we'd have been able to do nothing with it. You see, God's timing is perfect. And he will release the keys to us on exactly the right day. That's why we can trust him. And I think it's going to be very soon. And I trust him with the timing. But now's the time for us to build. I want you to be convinced that God is in this and to be active in this. You know, somebody once said to me that there are two ways to get to the top of the tree. You can either sit on an acorn and wait (laughs) and eventually, or, or you can begin climbing. You see, dreamers sit on acorns and hope and wait. We build. We build. This is a kingdom. Build your kingdom here. We're builders, co-workers with Christ. And you know, when you're climbing a a tree, it's important, the process is important, isn't it? If you you overstretch, you're, you're looking for a secure branch, aren't you, when you're climbing a tree? You'll remember this. We all did it when we were kids. You're climbing a tree. You're looking for a branch that's strong enough to take your weight, and then you're on that branch, and you're looking for one that's just within reach to get you up to the next bit. And it's exactly the same in church life. It's exactly the same with this project of, of buying and, and renovating a building. We've, we've got to... We've got to climb together, and we've got to climb with wisdom. You see, if we overstretch, then we're going to fall. If we stand on something that's too weak to hold us, we're going to fall as well. It won't be strong enough to hold us. And I want to just explain, in terms of God's timing, this is interesting for us, because, how can I put it? The climate, David was facing war on every side, Solomon was facing peace on every side. And I think the environment that we are in is a strong and healthy church life environment. I think we've climbed some branches, I think we've stood on some things that have helped us to now have the strength that we need to be able to reach for more. We're not stepping on, we're not taking such a huge risk that we're likely to fall. But we're also trusting God and it is a big faith step. So we, we've climbed some branches already. Let me list a few things that I think are important things that have happened in our life together. Firstly, we've laid a foundation of doctrine in the church. We've had 15 years of teaching. We've taught all the way through the New Testament, all the way through Paul's letters, all the way through the Gospels. We've taught lots from the Old Testament as well. And so there's been a foundation of the whole counsel of God that's built us together. That's vital for us as we still enjoy the Spirit, but we're built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The Word of God is our foundation. We've, we've been doing that for years. Also, we've got a clear sense of purpose together. We know that together, our primary purpose is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. We're here for him. We're here to love the Lord and to love each other and to love our city. Okay, that's our purpose. But we've also got a mission that we're agreed on. Jesus gave it to us, the Great Commission. We're to make disciples of all nations. We're to teach them, to baptise them, yeah, to help them all to follow Jesus. We know that. God has given us a clear sense of these things. He's given us a set of values that we kind of own together that make us us. And he's increasingly giving us a sense of vision that he's calling us to continue to grow and multiply, reaching new people in new places. So we've kind of got that. We've also managed to hang on to the heart of the gospel in church life. That's why we've got two more baptisms lined up for next Sunday morning. It's because people are hearing about Jesus, putting their trust in him, being born again, having repented and come to faith in him. You see, we've kept the gospel at the heart of things. We're interested in people going from death to life. And sometimes you can lose that in the midst of church life. We can forget what we're actually here for. You know, we've loved and served the poor. 
I mean, so many of you have served at the Breakfast Club or helped out with the Cap Debt Centre, and that's only increasing. But you see, these are branches that we've climbed together. We've got a healthy church. We've got a strong leadership team made up of men and women, old and young. You see, these are all good branches that we have climbed together. We've served the wider mission to the city and to the nations. We've given away thousands of pounds and people to church plant or to release leadership or to reach new places, being caught up with commission and all that means to be on an apostolic mission together. We've, we've done that. That's a branch that we've climbed. And we've seen God bless what we've been doing. He's, he's grown it. You know, we can sow and we can mow, but we can't grow anything. <laughs> You know, God's the one who gives the growth. And he's grown us, and he's multiplied us, and he's enabling us to continue to grow and multiply. And the other thing that I did want to mention, because I think it's something that's really important and something that demonstrates your heart, is that you have become an exceedingly generous church. You've given faithfully and regularly, even during a pandemic. And I just want to say, well done, because for me, that's one of the signs of a mature church, when we're not fickle about our giving, but we faithfully, generously, cheerfully give. And so all these branches are things that we've climbed together. And so from a timing perspective, we're secure. and means we can reach ahead now for something more. Again, like I say, not overstretching ourselves so that we fall, not standing on something weak so that we fall. This is one of those projects that requires genuine faith. I remember years ago when we were talking in New Frontiers about going from 200 churches to 400 churches, and one of the leaders at the time said, it's, it's beyond our reach and within our reach. That's God's kind of goal. Do you get that? It's beyond our reach and within our reach. It's going to require faith, but with God we can do it. By the grace of God, we're now well over 1,000 churches when we look back on those days and think we were going for 400. And we've got 200 churches in India alone. Wow, what God has done. How faithful he's been. But the boathouse is our next big branch. And I just want you to see that God's timing in this is is vital and important and perfect. So I want to say something about targets. Targets is what you're aiming for. Somebody said once, if you aim for nothing, that's exactly what you'll get every time. Now, we're not aiming for nothing. We're aiming for something. What was Solomon's target? What was Solomon's purpose? What was the aim? Why did Solomon want to build the temple? Well, he wanted to build the temple, obviously. But what was his real target? Why did he want to build the temple? If you look at the Westminster Shorter Shorter Catechism, it says this. Man's chief aim is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Man's chief aim is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And do you know what? That was Solomon's target too. That was what Solomon wanted. You read it in verse 5, he says this, I intend therefore to build a temple for the name of the Lord our God. Okay, so he's building a temple, but what's it for? It's for the name of the Lord his God. He's using it to glorify God. God. He was using this building project as an opportunity to bring glory to the name of the Lord that he loved and served. And can I just say that is our aim too. That is our type. This is so not about bricks and mortar. This is so not about carpets and curtains. This is about the name of the Lord our God. Okay, that's our target. We didn't buy the boathouse because we wanted to invest in real estate. Okay, although it is good stewardship. You know, it's good. Even if in 20 years, 30 years' time we want to sell it on as flats or as offices, you know, the money is is secure. Property is a good investment. But that's not why we're doing it. We're doing it for the name of the Lord our God. You know, we didn't buy the boathouse to make us more comfortable in our meetings. Though hopefully it will. We'll have a bit more space. We'll be able to do things. But we did it for the name of the Lord our God. That's why we're doing it. We're not doing it because we want something that looks good. Though hopefully it will give us a, a better front door, for want of a better phrase, a better profile. People will see and know where we are in a better way. But that's not why we're doing it. We're doing it for the name of the Lord our 
God. We bought it and we're going to renovate it to bring honour and glory to him. That is our aim. That is our target because we want the name of Jesus to be lifted up in Southampton and beyond as we work with the young, as we work with the old, as we reach out to the lost, as we reach out to the lonely, as we work with the poor and as we serve the downtrodden. We want all of that to bring glory to the Lord our God. Be in no doubt that in this building project, Jesus takes centre stage. It is all about him, it's all for him, it's for the advance of his kingdom that people might give him the praise and the glory. Do we get that? That is our aim, that is our target. So timing is God's timing. The target is to bring glory to God. Let's look at verse 11, because there's something in here that I want to mention about tenacity. Verse 11 says this. Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as food for his household, in addition to 20,000 baths of pressed olive oil. Solomon continued to do this for Hiram year after year. You know, Solomon needed a godly tenacity to get this project done. And as, as Hiram continued to supply all the cedar logs and the pine logs that Solomon wanted, the deal was Solomon in return would provide Hiram and his household with just shed loads of wheat and olive oil. I mean, when, you, when I calculated it, it was one thousand, uh, sorry, 115 million gallons. <laughs> I mean, just, just get your head around that for a minute. That's costly. That is costly. But more than that, it says in that scripture that they kept this up year after year. That's why it needed tenacity, because it was year after year. Tenacity is, is the determination to keep going, to hold a position in the face of obstacles, to keep going when things are tough. That's what tenacity is. And I remember a quote from Smith Wigglesworth who said, great faith is the product of great fights. Great testimonies are the outcome of great tests, and great triumphs only come after great trials. Now, we are going to need to be tenacious and determined as we enter into this next exciting phase of church life. It is going to be so costly, costly with our time, costly with our efforts, costly with our money. Like Solomon and Hiram, we're going to need to keep that aim of bringing glory to God really in front of our eyes if we're going to keep going. We're going to keep that in focus so that we can have the tenacity to keep going year after year, even when things get tough, even when we can't afford it, even when things are hard. We, can't, we mustn't settle. We must press on with vigour. I'm letting you know this now, so that when you feel the, the, the challenge of it, you understand. Okay? It's almost proactive pastoral care I'm giving you here. It's going to be tough. There are going to be times when you feel tired. There are going to be times when you think, I've got, no, I've got no money left. There are going to be times when you think, I can't serve again. So I want you to understand that. We're going to need a godly tenacity because it's going to take everything that we've got. It's, it's not going to be a walk up walk, you know, in, in the park out there. It's going to be more like climbing a mountain. In fact, I found these comments they were feedback cards from people who were going on mountain hikes in the Bridger Wilderness Park in Wyoming. So they get, they get back down again and they're able to fill in a little feedback card. Here's some of the comments. The paths need to be wider so people can walk holding hands. The paths need to be reconstructed. Please avoid building paths that go uphill. Too many bugs and leeches and spiders and webs. Please spray the wilderness to rid the area of these pests. <laughs> Please pave the paths so that they can be ploughed clear of snow in the winter. Chairlifts need to be in some places so that we can get to the wonderful views without having to hike them. <laughs> the coyotes made too much noise last night and kept me awake. Please eradicate these annoying animals. A small deer came into my camp and stole my jar of pickles. Is there a way I can get reimbursed? <laughs> 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 
Reflectors need to be placed on trees every 50 feet so that people can hike at night, hike at night with torches. Escalators would be helpful on steep uphill sections. A McDonald's at the top would be nice. <laughs> the, hang on, just get my head around this one. The places where paths do not exist are not well marked. <laughs> and then the last one, too many rocks in the mountains. I mean, it's, it's balmy, isn't it? But it, I, I'm not, it's going to take hard work. It's not going to be comfortable. There's no McDonald's at the top. Okay, there's no chairlifts. This is going to take tenacity. It's going to require us to dig, dig deep with fresh faith, fresh energy. It's not going to be a stroll in the park. Let me finish with just looking at teamwork. Because verse 18 says this. The craftsmen of Solomon and Hiram and the men of Gabal cut and prepared the timber and stone for the building of the temple. This is all about teamwork. This whole project is about teamwork. The church is a team. And we need to be tenacious, yes, but we need to work together if we're going to see this accomplished. Let me just read you this poem. Ten little Christians standing in a line. One disliked the preacher. Then there were nine. Nine little Christians stayed up very late. One overslept on Sunday, and then there were eight. Eight little Christians on their way to heaven. One took the low road, and then there were seven. Seven little Christians chirping like chicks. One disliked the worship style, then there were six. Six little Christians very much alive, but one lost interest, and then there were five. Five little Christians pulling for heaven's shore. One stopped to take a rest. Then there were four. Four little Christians, busy as a bee. One got their feelings hurt. Then there were three. Three little Christians knew not what to do. One joined the football club. Then there were two. Two little Christians, our rhyme is nearly done, differed with each other. And then there was none. Sad, but there are little bits that you look in there and you think, seen that, experienced that, felt that, said that. You know, we all need to be prepared to work together on this. I want you to understand, this isn't a project that I dreamed up, or the elders dreamed up, or the trustees dreamed up. This is something that God has put in our hearts, like David and Solomon did for the temple. And this is one of those opportunities for us to function as us, where genuinely everybody gets a part to play. We want to build the church that way. We always have. We believe in the priesthood of all believers. We believe that everybody's got different gifts and abilities that God has given you. We believe that everybody has got on him is here for a, for a reason. And so I want you to understand, as I'm speaking to you, whether that's here, online, at the college, God has a part for you, specifically, in this project. It might be to to use your practical skills. It might be to use your devotion to prayer. It might be to use your resources or your home or your finances or your uh, availability. Whatever it might be, God has a part for you to play in this project. You know, we dream of building a church of soul winners where we're all involved reaching people with the gospel in different ways in different, with different gifts. We, we've talked about being a lifeboat crew, haven't we? A lifeboat crew where we're all hands on deck, not, not a cruise liner where we're all passengers on some beds. There's a difference, isn't there? You and I all have a part to play. And Solomon's teamwork in this project, I don't know if you spotted it, but it came from relationship. There was a relationship going on, a family history with Hiram. And that's why there's this extraordinary level of, of teamwork and they managed to involve a huge and active labour force. 30,000 labourers were involved in it. 70,000 carriers, 80,000 stonecutters. I mean, there were three, nearly 3,500 foremen telling everybody else what to do. I mean, this was huge. I mean, it was a national project. Labourers came from all over Israel to take part in this. 
And we need to all gather ourselves to this next project and work together as a team. Now, of course, we're doing it for God, without doubt. But there's also a measure that we're doing it out of, I don't know how to quite describe it, family, being part of a family, being family loyalty maybe, where we feel like, like Solomon and Hiram, okay, we've got history together, we're part of the same family, Let's, look, I'll, you, I'll send you the resources, you send me food for our household, we'll sort out it between us. And so there's an element to which if we're part of this, let's be part of this, let's not be a bystander, let's say, no, I'm actually, I'm part of Life Church. So I'm going to put my bits into the pot as well. My time, my availability, my efforts, my prayers, my dreams, my gifts and abilities. So we need to be able to do that. We want you to. We want you to own it. We want you to stand with us in it. And there's a few ways, as I close, that you can do that. Very practically. Let me give you, I've got, I've got one, two, three, four, five, five things that you can do. So these are the things. If you want to write something down that you can do and take away from today, this could be it. Firstly, own the vision. By that I mean let it be something that you talk about in your home and you pray about and you dream about and you get excited about. Own it with us. Because the temptation can be to think, oh well that's happening over there or I'm not really that interested, that's just a building and we can get cynical can't we? But if this is something that God is going to do using all of us then we need to own it together. So one thing you can do is own the vision with us. Second thing you can do is pray about it. Pray about it in your home, pray about it in your life groups, pray about it with your family, and let it be something that you journey together. I remember when we first were thinking about planting Life Church Southampton, first thing we did was we gathered our kids together and we said, hey kids, come on, let's pray about this. We think God might be calling us to do this, but it's not me he's calling, it's us as a family. Let's pray. And every, t- every tea time, we'd sit and pray for Southampton and pray about whether we should move. And God was at work in that. So especially those of you that are responsible for leading your household, I want to encourage you to do that. Lead them in this adventure of faith. Thirdly, begin the faith journey of praying in the resources. Projects like this do us good because we have to trust God. And and we pray and God provides. You know, we we hadn't realised in in our family that our, our car tax was going to run out at the end of the month. No, our car insurance, sorry. And uh, we suddenly realised we hadn't saved up the money for the car insurance. And uh, so Joe said, um, well, we've, we've got to pay it, so we'll just have to pay it and we'll trust God for the money to come in. And that's where faith comes in. And so we, I, I prayed and, and she prayed. And then over the, over the next two days, the money came into our account from various different weird sources that we weren't expecting that covered, are going to cover the insurance. You see, praying in resources is an expression of faith. Okay? Now, we don't have the money that we need to renovate that building yet. But we can pray because we serve a God who does. So I want you to take part in that journey, praying in the resources with us. Fourthly, think about how your specific gifts can be used to make this a reality. Just think, what has God given me? What has God done in me? What things can I do? What do I have what, 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 what can I use? What, what skills have I got? What experience do I have to play my part? I've asked God that question and see if he highlights something to you. I don't know what it'll be, but I'm sure there'll be something. Remember, there were stonecutters, there were labourers, there were foremen. They all had different roles, but they were all vital. And lastly, I want you to think of this word, imagine. And can we just put up that last one? Imagine. I want you to imagine what God can do over the next 15 years. Think about what he's done in the first 15 years. But I want you to begin to imagine the lives that he can begin to reach. The communities that can start to be touched. The bodies that could potentially be healed as they're prayed for. The people that are in need that are provided for. The people that are lonely that find family. I want you to begin to imagine what God can do. And we're going to have a gift day together. 5th of September. And I want you to begin praying and imagining what could God do if we all play our part in this great adventure. So the idea is that God's timing is perfect. We're trusting him for everything that we need to do. His timing is 
perfect. We've got to remember the target. Remember, the aim is to glorify God, to bring praise to the name of Jesus. That's why we're doing it. We want his name to be made famous. Remember, it is going to require tenacity. It's going to be hard work. It's going to be tough. There are going to be some tough calls. There always are when big projects are involved. It's going to be tough. It's not a walk in the park. It's a climb up a mountain. But also, we're called to do it together. The crew of Life Church are called to build something beautiful for God. And I want you to play your part. We're going to close by singing together. Timo's going to lead us in this great song, Build Your Kingdom Here. And that's what we're asking. We're asking God to build and to help us to build something beautiful for him. So wherever you are, why don't we just stand together, if you're able to, and uh, let's bring this adventure and this project before God and ask him to glorify Jesus through it.